Now, there's so many things that I can tell you about the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, but I would like to bring back to your minds the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that he would get all of his people through Brother Farrakhan. I'm going to say that again. Through Brother Farrakhan, he would get all of his people. And he is proving that every day. Because there's no other man that can draw the attention of our people like Brother Farrakhan is doing in every city across America. They want him in England. They want him in Africa. They want him all over the world. Why? Because the people are thirsting for knowledge. The people are thirsting for truth. But somebody has to be willing to stand up and deliver that truth and to be bold enough to speak it in the face of the enemy and that is what you have in a man of God the Honorable Louis Farrakhan what a leader he is I love that man and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad his prayer was answered when he asked for God to give him help you have in the scriptures and in the Quran it says, and certainly we gave Moses the book and we appointed with him his brother Aaron and Ader. Then we said, go you both to the people who reject our messages. Go you both, Moses and Aaron, to Pharaoh and plead with Pharaoh to let my people go. So Moses had power in the rock, but Aaron, his brother, also had that power. So you cannot look at Brother Farrakhan and separate him or take him away from the very source and light that makes him what he is, and that is his teacher the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In fact about it, those of us who think that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad deserted us or betrayed us and left us out here without a guide, without direction, you underestimated the wisdom of that man. How did you underestimate him? Because if your enemies underestimated him, well, how do you think we would look at him? The enemy never expected the nation of Islam to rise again. They were so happy that it fell in 1975. And they underestimated the wisdom and the power of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the word that the, that the very seeds of wisdom planted deeply in the heart and in the mind of those who love God and love truth that before long that seed would spring up before long that man that they overlooked would come back and raise and bring the nation of Islam back. This is a marvelous work that is happening before our very eyes. Can you bear witness to that? Yes, sir. And how do you bear witness to it? You know deep down in your soul, in your heart, that no black man could stand in America and do the work that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is doing without being killed, without being totally destroyed. So there's got to be a force. There has to be something that's protecting and around Brother Farrakhan that makes him to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and death bounces off of him. 
death comes to him and runs from him. Why? Because death as it approaches the messenger of God has to run away from him because God and his power is standing right there in the valley. That's why he fears no death. He fears no evil because he walks with God. He talks and God is with them. Wherever he goes, God is with Brother Farrakhan. Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. I love that man. And that man you are about to behold in just a few minutes. Don't get impatient. Don't get tired. You may miss something. You know, the scriptures refer to the messenger of God as a stone of stumbling. Why? Because he is a mortal like you and I. He has eyes like you and I. He has ears. He has a mouth. He is human. He eats and sleeps and walks. And since we have always underestimated the power within ourselves when that power is displayed or manifested we will always question it we will always doubt it because you and I have never believed in ourselves then with the white man's psychology on you coming from a black man you would automatically reject it anyway because you and I have been taught to reject self, hate self, disrespect self. So knowledge and truth coming from some of one of your own, you would automatically disregard. You would automatically throw it out the window because you have never thought any good of yourself. So when you look at Brother Farrakhan, you're in awe. You love him, you love the word. But deep down inside, you ask yourself, is it lies? Or is it Memorex? Is it butter or is it parquet? I don't know. Is he real? Because I have never thought good of myself. And this man touches my heart and my soul. He's got to be a phony. Child, don't go near Farrakhan. You know, he talks real good. Talk to me. Don't look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. He talks so well, he's so eloquent, but is it real? Can it be that God lives in a human being? Can it be that God loves me? Can it be that God is interested in black folk? Oh, I just can't be. God ain't never done nothing for us but give us hell. He brought us over here from our own country. We were beaten and raped. God's not interested in us. We've been here 400 and something years and the, our condition and sojourn in America is getting worse every day. God can't be interested in us. I don't believe. As the scripture says, you cut off and without hope but God is interested in you God does love you because he came here by himself he defied all the odds and went against everybody who said this is the scripture talking don't be bothered this is so many words with those, they are dead people. They have no hope. And God said, oh, I am the best Noah. I will show you that I am God because I have power over death. And your eyes and your ears are opening to the truth of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the graves have been knocked 
on. Is that right? And you are about to awaken to another truth, more truth. You're about to increase in your knowledge, in your understanding of yourself because God is interested in black folk and he wants you for himself. So he gives you the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, a man by which he will not only awaken your eyes and open your ears, but he will destroy the very enemy that has kept you in this wrecked condition. Here he is, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, brothers and sisters. Allahu Akbar, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. To Allah, we give praise and thanks for raising up in our midst a divine leader, a divine teacher, a divine guide, his messenger to us, the Messiah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> to Minister Ishmael, Muhammad, laboring staff, brothers and sisters, visitors and friends. Once again, it is a great uh, pleasure for me to be before you. Whenever I come out, it is because I am inspired by Allah to do so. And when he inspires me to come out, it is because there is a message that I believe he desires for you to have, for us to have. My dear brothers and sisters, to all of our visitors and guests, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to visit Muhammad's Mosque, Mosque Maryam. This is really your home. When you see the star and the crescent, that's not some hocus-pocus sign. That star and crescent represents the universe which represents God himself. The flag of Islam, which is your flag, given to you by God himself as he is the originator of the universe and you are the first people in the universe. So your fathers before you are creators, owners and makers of what you see called universe. And so it is nothing but right that you wear the greatest and only universe flag, the sun, moon and stars. This flag represents freedom, justice, and equality, and it represents perfect submission and obedience to the will of God. The sun, as great as it is, it submits to a law. The moon, as great as it is, is in submission to a law. The stars are all in obedience 
to divine law. It is only man who is out of order because man is in rebellion to divine will and divine law. So God gives us a flag that represents power to a powerless people to say to you, if you desire to come back into the power of yourself and the power of God and the power to will and the power to create and the power to build, then God asks you today to submit. And if you will submit to do his will, then he will guide you out of the condition into which you find yourselves. No matter how low that condition may be, it is not hopeless. No matter how weak you think you are, no matter how ignorant you think you may be, if you submit to God, he will raise you out of that state in which you find yourselves and give you greatness. We are in a period of great trial for the nation of Islam. The Masons say, I've been tried and I'm willing to be tried again. No man can come to God without being tried. No person can attend to greatness without being tried. In the Holy Quran, we are told that Allah tries the believer at least once a year severely. Now think about that. If you say you believe in God, then at least once a year you will come under some kind of severe trial. Trials, according to the Holy Quran, purify. Because whenever we are tested, we manifest our weaknesses and our strengths. So a test or a trial is not bad for us. It will show us what we need to do to better ourselves in the eyes of God. The nation of Islam, under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, under the guidance of Louis Farrakhan is really a new nation of Islam. The nation of Islam under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for the first 44 years of his time among us was pretty much destroyed when one came into power whose ideas and thoughts were at variance with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That nation of Islam fell, or we can say died. But the Quran raises the question, when we become as dust or as bones, shall we be raised again and Allah says in the Quran he is so powerful that he is able to resurrect you even to the tips of your fingers he can bring it back exactly as it was he has power over all things so the black people were in grief and sad because the strongest, most disciplined black organization in the history of our sojourn in America came up like a beautiful flower and black people all over America were beginning to marvel at 
Elijah Muhammad and his ministers, number one of them being Malcolm X. And then, in a flash, a trial came up. And that trial started over the personal life of Elijah Muhammad. When Spike Lee came to visit me to ask me some questions about Malcolm X and what I knew about Malcolm's life and Malcolm's death, I asked Spike, have you read the Holy Quran? He said, no. I said, Spike, have you studied the history of the prophets? He said, no. I said, then by what yardstick? Will you measure the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? In Spike's talk with me, he mentioned Elijah Muhammad's personal life in this way. He said, Mr. Muhammad's extracurricular activities. And I asked Mr. Lee, I said, why would you say extracurricular activities? And he said, I was trying to be kind. Now, I, I, I don't think it's a, a cause for great upset because from his perspective, saying Mr. Muhammad's extracurricular activities sounded decent to him but from my perspective it was slander <laughs> now certainly when you talk about persons who are highly respected highly regarded and you're dealing with their personal lives you might wish to say extracurricular activities to cover something dirty in their life. So from your vantage point, you being kind. But had my brother only understood the Quran a little and studied the lives of the prophets just a little, he would have understood. It would seem to me that from our perspective, it is slander. I said to Mr. Lee, if you were writing the life of Abraham, the friend of God, could you condemn Abraham which one of you who are Christians or Hebrews or Muslims which one of you would have the nerve in the face of Abraham's being the father of modern monotheistic belief the father of the Jews the father of the Christians and the father of the Muslims which one of you would be bold enough today to condemn the father of the righteous who is said to be the friend of God I'm asking a simple question and of course there is no Christian, no Jew, no Muslim 
who would condemn Father Abraham. But according to the Bible, Abraham fathered a child from Hagar. Hagar was the handmaiden of Sarah. She was a virgin who did chores for Sarah, living in the house of Abraham. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was not able to bear. According to the Bible, she was a barren woman. Abraham then enters into a relationship with Hagar and she becomes pregnant with a child. From the Jewish perspective, the child's name is Ishmael, I mean uh, Isaac. But from the Muslim perspective, the child's name is Ishmael. But whether you believe the child was Ishmael or Isaac, the point is the woman became pregnant for Abraham. In Sarah's house. Now if you put yourself in Sarah's shoes, Sarah was certainly a little upset. I wouldn't say a little upset. I would figure Sarah was upset. So Abraham put Hagar and Ishmael out of the house. And you find Hagar running in the wilderness with her child. Abraham had food on his table. Sarah had food in front of her provided for her by Abraham. But Hagar was running in the wilderness with her baby with no provision from Abraham. Yet he's the friend of God. Any man that abandons a woman who is in travail with his child would not be considered a good man. Is that correct? Any man that abandons a woman after she has a little child and banishes that woman and does not provide for that woman in today's society. The woman could complain to the court and have him arrested for non-support. Come on. Yet Abraham was the friend of God doing such a thing. Well, since God knows all, sees all, is omniscient, omnipresent, knows today, tomorrow, and yesterday, then what did God know about tomorrow and today that Abraham could put Hagar and her child out in the wilderness with no support, and yet God said, he's my friend. And I love him so much, I will multiply his seed as the sand on the beach or as the stars in the heavens. This tells you, brothers, sisters, you have to be very careful how you judge the affairs of men of God lest you fall under judgment yourself now I imagine Abraham's contemporaries not knowing what God had in mind by this probably condemned Abraham I'm sure there were some and if probably if Spike were living in that time 
and met uh, Ishmael as he was growing up, he would say, Ishmael, I, um, I um, want to talk to you about your father's extracurricular <laughs> activities. <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps Mr. Lee would have approached him like that. Because from his perspective, the man was wrong. And from his perspective, he's correct. But since he knows not the ultimate plan of God, then he stands at the bar of judgment and justice when he speaks his mind against the man of God. Now, why am I saying this? The domestic life of Abraham is to serve as a sign of something very big. All of us as Muslims, if you go to the city of Mecca, you have to run between the hills the Safa and the Marwa following the path of Abraham Abraham's uh, I mean the path of Hagar pardon me Hagar's words are found in the Psalms of David Hagar is looking to hills where's my help so David says I will look unto the hills. But it doesn't say, from whence cometh my help. That's a question. From where will my help come? Not my help is coming from the hills. I'm looking to the hills, but the hills are not helping me. Where is my help coming from? And then David answers, my help cometh from the Lord. Here's a woman in the wilderness looking to powerful people to help her. A nation looking to powerful governments to help them. Whence cometh my help? My help cometh from God. Why did God allow this woman to flee in the wilderness? That she might be a sign of you. My dear and beloved black woman. You are today without a man. You are today with babies. But no male help. You can't look to men. Most of you are very sad, sad women. And every time you find a man that you think will be a help to you, you end up disappointed because you have to end up being his other mother. No, no, no. I just, brothers, don't, don't, don't feel bad. Don't, don't feel bad. I'm not putting us down, brothers. I'm not putting us down. In just a few minutes, with the help of God, we'll pick us up. <laughs> now, sisters. When you have babies, and you have babies not out of space, you have babies from a man. So evidently in your life, you met a man in whom you at least believed there was some value to the man. Otherwise, you would never have opened your knees to such man. Uh, I am not being vulgar, I'm just telling <laughs> the truth. Well, 
It's pretty horrible when you find out after such event has taken place and you are now filled with life that he abandons you because he's irresponsible. And so you ask from whence cometh my help. And you have to answer, black woman, my help cometh from the Lord. Our women today are out from under the rule of man because the rule of man over woman has not profited women. So now the woman is free of the rule of man, so she now looking to where her real help comes from. And her help cometh from the Lord. So the woman now, just follow this. So the woman is trying in her sadness, in her disillusionment, in her disappointment, in her despair, in her frustration, in her extraordinary pain, she's reaching for God. And as she reaches for him, he reaches for her. So that's why the number 19 is so significant, because it's God and the woman together now to make a new man. And that's why you see in the picture of the Messiah, you don't see an earthly father. You just see Mary and God. <laughs> it's something. That's the time we're living in. So it is necessary for Spike Lee to do what he's doing. It is necessary for Malcolm's life to be brought before the world. It is necessary that the view of disbelievers and hypocrites and devils be put before the world on Elijah Muhammad and the nation of Islam. Why is that necessary? Well, if you want a tree to grow, you put manure somewhere. So even, <laughs> even though it smells terrible, but it gives you a healthy growth. So, bear it, you know what I mean? It doesn't smell too nice. Something is in the atmosphere. <laughs> Somebody pouring stuff around the base of the tree. But if you can go through it, and you can, you'll come out of it with a wonderful growth. This new nation of Islam, under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's guidance, coming from Minister Louis Farrakhan, has not been tried like the old nation of Islam. And those older Muslims who are here today, who went through the 60s, who loved Malcolm X, who were inspired by Malcolm X, who was the great student and minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Those Muslims were hurt to the core of their hearts when that man turned against his teacher over such trivia 
as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad having wives and there producing children for him. You say, well, Brother Farrakhan, why is that trivia? I asked Mr. Lee, I said, brother, I said, Malcolm X never met Prophet Muhammad. Malcolm was inspired by Elijah Muhammad when he was living a criminal life. He was a pimp, a hustler, a stick-up man, a number runner. He was like most of us. But when he met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he underwent a profound change. And it is that Malcolm X who once was Malcolm Little that the whole world began to hear about and tremble at the mention of his name. Since Prophet Muhammad didn't come to America and get him out of jail, but Elijah Muhammad did. Elijah Muhammad wrote him while he was in prison. Elijah Muhammad taught him through the letters that he wrote him and guided his study while he was in prison. And when he came from prison, having done seven years, seven months, and seven days, the NAACP would not put him to work. The Urban League would not put him to work. The Baptist Church would not have allowed him to preach the gospel. But Elijah Muhammad did. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't remind him of what was because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew that God raised him from a nothing life. Elijah Muhammad said he was so far down in the mud when Master Farad Muhammad found him till just his eyeballs were peeping out. So when a man comes from that low in the mud, he can't throw off at another brother who is in the mud. So Elijah Muhammad picked brother up out of the mud and cleaned him up and stood him up and gave him a platform and wisdom to speak to the world. How do you know that Elijah Muhammad did this for Malcolm, Brother Farrakhan? Because he did it for me. Brothers and sisters, I asked Mr. Lee, I said, do you really believe that Malcolm X left Elijah Muhammad because of Elijah Muhammad's domestic life? Do you really, really believe that? that Malcolm had become so moral, so clean, so pure, that when he found out that his teacher had wives, 
it blew his mind. A man who studied the Holy Quran and a man who had depth in the Bible as well as the Holy Quran. Malcolm was no dummy. You mean Elijah fulfilling what is written in the book would disturb him after he preached that this man would fulfill that which the former prophets had done? I mean, think about that. And I said, if he were disturbed about Elijah, whom he referred to as a messenger, and it was, he, it was Malcolm who taught me to call Elijah Muhammad, Messenger Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. These are titles that Elijah, the, I mean Honorable, he didn't give that to himself. Malcolm did it. The title messenger belonged to him. And Malcolm was unafraid to hurl that title before any scholar in the world. This man is messenger Elijah Muhammad. And if he knew him as a messenger, he knew the book that refers to the lives of the messengers. And they all had wives. They all had wives. Now, I asked Mr. Lee, I said, brother. He said, well, he had children by teenage girls. Some of them were in their late teens, it's true. Is that a crime? Well, <laughs> just calm down. Calm down. Just calm down. Your perception of the divine life, or life of prophets and great men is so warped because you judge them by their relationship with women. <clears throat> and if that's the way you judge, I mean, okay, that's the yardstick you want to use, then take your Bible and bury it or burn it and never ever refer to the prophets of God again as exemplary men. Because after all, they had many more wives than Elijah. No, wait, don't get excited. Think, woman. David is the beloved. How many wives did David have? Talk. I don't even know myself. I wasn't interested in it. But I know he had a plenty. <laughs> and he produced a son, Solomon, who is the wisest prophet of the book. How many did Solomon have? I don't even know how that man handled all of this. I take my hat off to him. Solomon, you the baddest man that I ever have written about. You the baddest. <laughs> Anytime a man can handle one woman, he deserves a crown. A starry crown at that. But if a man can handle two, give him two crowns. But when a man got a thousand, I don't understand that. Maybe, maybe, this, maybe they wrote it wrong. Maybe, maybe they translated it wrong. You know? But in case they did, 
even if he had 10 and they added two zeros by mistake. That did not detract one atom from the wisdom of the man and from the backing of God of that man. Now they said a lot of things about Martin Luther King Jr. But everybody here has benefited because that man came this way. Are you going to sit in the seat of judgment of Martin Luther King Jr. because he had a woman? You have sick minds. You don't know what God has in his mind for the man that he chooses for that time and that moment in history. You don't understand the workings of God. You want to put God down on your funky level. So you can deal with God in a funky manner because you are funky people who love scandal, who love filth, who can't wait to open your low down dirty mouths about any nasty thing you hear about somebody else while you hide your own damn filth in every closet. That's why the churches are falling apart. That's why our communities and families are falling apart because they're filled with gossip and slander. But God allowed this to happen as a means of trial. come back to Mr. Lee I said brother I said Malcolm leaves Elijah and goes to follow Prophet Muhammad the real Islam the traditional Islam how many wives did Prophet Muhammad have? He had 11. And the Quran cut it down to nine. And one of them, Aisha, his favorite. When he married her, she was a pre-teenager. She was 11. And he had conjugal relations with her when she was 14. Was he a man of God? This book, Quran, is the testimony that whether he had sex with a 14-year-old who became his wife, or a 35-year-old woman who became his wife, or a slave woman who became his wife, he transformed the lives of nearly a billion people on the earth with this book and his example. kind of low down men when we met Elijah Muhammad. I can't speak for you but I speak for myself. 
I wasn't no holy man when I met Elijah Muhammad. I wasn't real bad either. But. <laughs> I'm not going to lie on myself. <laughs> when I hear some of the brothers tell me about what they used to do, I have to sit in amazement because I never did those things. <laughs> I was a sinner <laughs> and had fallen way, way, way short of the glory of God. And when I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he made me a faithful man to my wife. His teachings. And I saw him do this for countless tens of thousands. Could he the father of our faith, the father of our moral de development, be a dirty man? Wait, 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 sometimes it could be. Sometimes it could be. But I suggest to you that there's much more to Brother Malcolm's defection from the nation than the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad. And that's our side of the story that the public will never get from the Spike Lee film. Our side of the story that the public will never get from Warner Brothers. Our side of the story that the public can only get from those of us who walked with Malcolm. Our side of the story that the public can only get from those of us who walked with Malcolm and knew him a lot better than those who claim to know him today. The white people and black people who love Malcolm and the white people who wish to use Malcolm to create hatred against the nation of Islam. And when the spin doctors begin to work their magic after the movie comes out, they will retry the case <clears throat> and make a whole nation of people guilty of the murder of Malcolm X. When Mr. Lee is asked, who uh, killed Spike? I mean, who killed Malcolm? The nation of Islam. The, the black Muslims did it. Spike called five names to me of persons and asked me, did I know them? I told him, no, I, I don't know them. These are the names that Talmadge Hare, the one who was caught at the scene of Malcolm's assassination, ultimately named as the brothers who were with him in the assassination of Malcolm X. As you can recall, at the trial of Malcolm, at the trial, Talmadge Hare said these two men, Thomas and Butler, were not involved. They asked him who was, he would not say. And the testimony of false witnesses put 
Norman Butler and Thomas Johnson in prison for 26 years of their life for a crime that they did not commit. When Haya finally named those with him, the government refused to reopen the case. So when you hear about some Catholics involved in a criminal activity, do they indict the whole church? I mean, just think about that. When Jews get involved in criminal behavior, is the whole synagogue involved? Some of these sisters and brothers here today were in the nation of Islam when Malcolm was assassinated. They don't know nothing about it. Why should they be charged? It is because they were members of the nation. We don't know whether they were agents or real believers. But when the whole nation of Islam is condemned, then it's because there's another motive. It is this tiny budding nation today that they never thought they'd see come back. That they're frightened of, brothers and sisters. There has never been a black man in the history of America to go into the deep south and draw 55 to 60,000 of his people to come and hear him speak. This is frightening to white people. And they know they don't control Louis Farrakhan. So in Washington, D.C. now, for the last four nights, a so-called expose inside the nation of Islam. On prime time lies, I mean live, pardon me. Our national spokesman and our minister of health was attacked by Chris Wallace as perpetrating fraud and ripping off our poor people. And you know how they used it? They took the medication that we got from Kenya that Brother Aline charges $250 for a six month supply. And he said they can get it for 50 some dollars in some cut rate place under another name. Minister Aline, when they said, well, what do you say to the charge that people say you're ripping off your people? He said, well, those who think like that can go to hell. <laughs> well, well well, I spoke with Minister Aleem yesterday. <laughs> and believe me, he gave that man all kinds of evidence. But that one sentence is what they picked out of the interview to make the point. And he made the point. I raise this in defense of my brother.
I came here today with a leather coat on that has fur on it. The coat cost, I think, a little over a thousand dollars. And I bought it from a black brother. And I let it stay in his store. And I paid him. <laughs> in a few installments. <laughs> I like my coat. It was a nice coat. You and you. When you go downtown and you see something you like, the car you drive, did you, did you pay for it outright? Not unless you deal it. <laughs> or you hit the lottery. You had to put something down and every month you praying that God will help you. <laughs> lest they will repossess your car. Is that right? Now let's, let's reason together. Dr. Alim's whole treatment, they said, cost $2,200 to $2,400. And this is ripping off the black community. Get a toothache. Just get a toothache. Fall down, cut your hand, and go to the emergency room. Talk to me! And the first thing they ask me, you, 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 you have any insurance? How are you going to pay for this? And when they get finished with x-rays and whatnot, you can't go to a doctor today for less than $50. To me. When they give you a prescription, you go to the drugstore. And the doctors usually get a cut from the prescription. There are generic drugs and there are name brand drugs. Come on, let's deal. I would have said to Mr. Mike Wallace or Chris Wallace, you're Jewish, aren't you? Well, what has that got to do with it, Farrakhan? Well, see, a lot of your people own the buildings where my people live. You don't give a damn how poor my people are when you charge them three and four and five hundred dollars for one room. Talk to me, white man! gonna act now like Minister Alim is doing something terrible. How can you compare $2,400 to your life, man? If you got AIDS, you're gonna die unless you get the right kind of medication. If you got the right kind, what the hell is $2,400 to save your life when you spend that in suits and diamonds and drugs and alcohol and any damn thing you want? They didn't tell you how much AZT costs. <laughs> AZT will cost you from six to ten thousand dollars a year, and there's no guarantee that you're gonna be well. But the way they put it, they showed one man on the pill, and his T cell count had gone to four. But they never told you that of the over 1,000 patients that he and Dr. Justice have treated, they have an 82% recovery rate. They didn't tell you that. Why do you think the National Institute of Health has
has reversed their position and now will allocate millions of dollars for clinical trials. It's because they learned something from Dr. Ali. And what you don't know, I know it's hot in here, but hell is a hotter day coming, so let's take this. In Dr. Justice's office in New York, you notice how it was very dark? They had a hidden camera in her office. So what, what are you after? You've assigned our people to death. You want them to die. We went to Africa and found that this black man had developed a medication that has reversed the symptoms. You angry with us because we are beating back your plague of death? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So now you want to discredit us in the eyes of our people so that our people will say, them damn Muslims <laughs> ripping us off. If you fell for it, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. If you fell for it, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, what is their aim? Destroy the nation, but above all, get Farrakhan. My dear brothers and sisters, I know that our time is... Uh, no, I can't. I... If you will bear with me, I'm asking you to come back on Wednesday so I will finish this. Oh, the sister saying, what about Wednesday? We well, I can't um, go further today because time is on us. But I want to say to you, sisters and brothers, members of the nation of Islam, In this period of darkness, when we will be attacked and slander will be hurled at our doorstep again, you will be tried. If you are better than those who went before you, you will stand up. If you are not as good, you will fall. I close with uh, this statement from the Bible. There was a woman in the book of Revelations who was pregnant but she was pregnant with a man-child and this man-child was destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron and the dragon stood before the woman to devour her baby as soon as it was born and the dragon spewed out of its mouth a flood to carry the woman and her baby away. But the earth helped the woman and swallowed the water, making the dragon's intentions 
of non-effect. This has many meanings on many levels. I shall only concern us today with two meanings. To our sisters, you are producing wonderful children today. You don't realize the tremendous gift that God is blessing all of us with through your wombs. When you go home today, you look at your little boys and your little girls, and as you watch them and listen to them, ask yourself, what level are they on in comparison to where I was when I was their age? And you will find that they are superior to you and to me. They are superior. You go to school and your children are called disruptive. They're called hyper. They want to give you drugs to calm your children down. See, they have to slow them down in order for the teacher to catch up to where their minds are. Now, I'm not just saying this to be saying it. Your children are more swift than you. My uh, daughter-in-law was telling me the other day and as she was getting ready to move into her new home, she went to the new home and they were sitting in their little van and they had brought um, some um, Cheerios or some, some, something from the old house and they had milk but they didn't have any containers and they were waiting for her husband to come so he could let them in the house. So they're out in front of the house. So the little one, who's two years old, said, well, you know, she wants something to drink. She said, well, sweetheart, we don't have any cups. Daddy should be here soon. The little one said, I, I know, he said, but mommy, let's go to McDonald's. They have cups and buy some cups. And in other words, why didn't you think of that? I'm hungry. <laughs> That's how swift your babies are. Don't limit your children by your limitations. You must speed up your development in order to keep up with their accelerated motion. Now, I say that to say this that your little boy children, they're children born from your suffering as women, your despair, your frustration, and you're looking for help and can't find none. So even those of you who ran away from church and thought it was too strict or this and that, you find yourself falling down on your knees, praying to the God that you were taught from a little child. And you find God reaching out, helping you. And that's why many of you sisters are much more spiritual than the brothers. Because you have a closer relationship to God because you need him to help you raise these children. Right? <clears throat> Those boy children are powerful. But if you put them in the wrong place, their growth will be retarded because 
the dragon sees that the man child that you coming up has a destiny to rule for as it was in the beginning so shall it be in the ending your children are the future rulers and they know that they want to be the ruler in the new world so the only way they can continue to rule is to keep you from producing that child so they fill you with a flood of foolishness and you sit by your televisions hours out of the day looking at foolish soap operas you won't pick up a book and read you won't develop your magnificent minds. You listen to radio and filthy songs and raps as often as you can. And you see yourself in the loneliness of your room dancing and shaking it. <laughs> What, what kind of future do our babies have? The dragon is filling your head with a flood of propaganda that is destined to kill your children because your children are feeding not just from your breast, but they're feeding from your minds. And if you don't have anything worthwhile on your mind, then how will the children feed and develop into that great black man and woman that they're destined to become unless you set your mind to a higher pursuit? That's one meaning. But the real meaning of it, the woman here is style. It's a messenger of God styled as a woman because he's pregnant with a nation of people that he has to deliver and the male members of that nation are going to grow to rule and the dragon or white man knows that his future is not there anymore brother white folks are falling fast Black man rising. The babies are the key to the future. These young brothers, these are the mighty warriors of today and tomorrow. So the dragon is here trying to kill the, the, the baby as soon as it is born. The flood, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, represents a flood of propaganda. And in a flood, it carries you away. It uproots trees. It brings snakes out of their hiding places. So when the flood hits, and it is beginning now, and after the movie breaks on Wednesday, when they, you hear the television shows and the way they'll be talking and the writings, they'll be focusing in on the nation of Islam. The whole idea is to carry you away, young FOI. You've just been birthed into the knowledge you are not strong enough yet so they want to carry you away with a flood of propaganda they would love to turn you against me and they would love that one of you my own brothers would have a bullet 
in the chamber of your weapon marked for me so that they could say he Farrakhan was a violent man and he died violently he was an anti-white racist anti-semite hater and thank God he's gone not so the desire of the wicked but I don't believe that that's the desire of God Muslims gird up your loins and be strong resist Satan and he will flee from you the flood is on the way but the earth meaning the people the people have already been prepared by God to hear the propaganda but say wait a minute something's missing here something ain't right here you see some of you may be fooled some of you may be taken off track no our people are gonna make it and you know what? After they put Mr. X in front of the whole world, the people are going to say, mm, Malcolm was great. But Malcolm is gone. <laughs> Who today is giving out X's. <laughs> Who today is standing for the black man uncompromisingly? Who today is the champion of the justice for black people in America and throughout the world? They'll have to say, not Malcolm X, but Farrakhan! Farrakhan! As-salamu alaykum! Would you be seated for just a minute? Would you please? Thank you. I'm going to continue this on Wednesday night. Sisters, don't mind. Even if you don't hear it, you'll get the tape. But on Wednesday night, I want to talk from this point. about the time that we're living in and what the time is bringing up not out of white people but out of us it's not white people killing us like we are killing one another it's very difficult for anybody to say the white man is the devil when it's us carjacking it's us doing evil one to the other what is happening to us Wednesday night we want to explore the time I'm sorry I didn't do it today but I'm guided by the Spirit of Allah and I I went this direction and so if it's the will of Allah on Wednesday 
meet me right here in the gymnasium at 7.30. And by the help of God, we'll uh, finish this subject. Brothers and sisters, as you leave, do nothing unto anyone that you would not like to have done unto yourselves. Treat everyone right, but if anyone molests you, we don't teach you to turn the other cheek. In that case, fight with those who fight with you, and may Allah bless you to be victorious. Until Wednesday, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, there will be brothers and sisters at the doors with receptacles. And if you would like on your way out to make further contributions, please do so. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.